Thank you, Alistair, and uh, thanks also for the invitation. So for, for WWF, the question obviously is why do we seek to, to change behaviour? And essentially it's because we know that in Western societies, particularly the UK, but increasingly in emerging economies, uh, it's because the way that people behave is a major driver for um, environmental biodiversity loss and for problems like climate change, as Helen was talking about. So for an example here, um, the Cerrado and Amazonia areas of Brazil uh, clearing uh, land, forest land for cattle ranching to provide beef for Western style diets. Uh, the top graph here is um, from the Living Planet report, and this is the data from 2010. We're going to be launching a new Living Planet report in, in May this year. But this essentially shows that the, um, the Living Planet index, uh, the decline in biodiversity over a sort of 30, 40 year period since the 1970s. And the next one shows essentially the reason for why that's the case. That's our global ecological footprint. It's the amount that we're consuming resources. And the, the one index line there is the world's biocapacity. So as soon as we're above that line, circa the sort of 1970s, we're above the world's carrying capacity, eating into its natural resources. And, uh, and it's not replenishing at the rate that, that would be sustainable. So essentially, WWF's mission is to get that, that top line going uh, up again and the bottom line going down. Yeah, up, down. I'm getting that right, I think. Um, and essentially, we'll only achieve that through behaving change, uh, behavior changes. So uh, Helen was talking about her, the markets elsewhere that Tesco operates in. That's incredibly important. You know, that not only in the UK do we seek to change behaviors, but in other countries as well, where we need to try and get them onto more fundamentally sustainable development pathways. Um, there are other organizations that we, uh, we've been working with on this uh, project, which we call Common Cause. And we found that whether it's uh, campaigning and working on issues of, um, of injustice or poverty or human rights, um, we all share a kind of a common cause in, in tackling these, these big changes and seeking to look at the, uh, the, the values that underpin um, the, the behaviours and, and attitudes that, that people follow. Um, I'm a campaigner with WWF, that's my, been my background, so although I'm not a specialist on this, I'm going to speak from my experience as a campaigner because it's kind of, it's essentially what, what's interesting in motivating and engaging people, communicating with them to get them to change their behaviour. But what essentially is common to all of the issues on which these organizations campaign and work is that the scale of the challenge they face, whether it's climate change or, or um, human rights abuses or poverty, uh, the scale of that challenge is not being met by the actions that, that we can muster through, through encouraging people to change behaviors. If they were merely a case of, uh, of, of people accepting that they were dangerous challenges or abhorrent uh, challenges, then they would have been solved a long time ago. And Copenhagen, uh, Likewise, if it was a case of presenting the arguments um, rationally and the evidence base, it would have been a very different outcome, but it, it wasn't. But it's not for want of allies. I mean, the politicians in this room, I mean, Jeff referred to the people who consistently, consistently call for changes um, in the world around us, the, the public. But also a lot of these politicians around the table in Copenhagen, uh, they also had polit um, political and p personal commitment to the agenda, but they couldn't yet... Uh, make the decisions that were really required. And what they often tell us is that they say that they feel their hands are tied or there's not the political space in which they can operate to make, um, make different changes. Uh, so for our point of view, it's, it's how do we get people more concerned and more engaged politically to write to their MPs or to join a demonstration? These are the sorts of actions that are much more meaningful in terms of driving real behaviour change and creating that public and political space into which businesses and, and politicians can move. Uh, how do we get people more engaged to the stage where they act uh, in ways that start to resolve these problems rather than often unintentionally exacerbating them? And the work on Common Cause has been looking at how this essentially is underpinned by values, so how our, our values, the values that we all hold, are related to the attitudes that we hold and the behaviours that we reenact. Um, and this diagram, I should say, is obviously a vast oversimplification of all of the kind of complex uh, range of relationships that operate within all of us about our values, attitudes, and, and emotions. But it essentially illustrates that we've got to operate at the kind of the values end of the spectrum if we really want to affect change. So what are our values? They're kind of uh, guiding principles. They're shaped by a range of influences, whether it's our family or our workplace or the media that we consume, social groups in which we operate. But they're what we apply unconsciously often uh, across situations. They might seem abstract, but they underpin and influence all of our attitudes and our behaviours. They've been shown to influence our political persuasions, 
our willingness to participate in social or um, political actions, our career choices, ecological footprints, our resources, and our personal feelings of well-being. They influence what we think and they influence how we act. I'm going to skim over now a huge body of research and apologies for this, but um, we really don't have the time. Um, but as I said, as a campaigner, I'm interested in this in terms of how, it, how we can communicate with people and how we can engage them. And essentially, the body of research suggests that when it comes to people's attitudes about things that matter to them, politics or towards minority rights uh, or towards protection of the environment, and how this motivates them to behave, uh, this suggests there's a certain uh, correlation, very clear association between holding particular values and our issues of concern, such as protecting the natural world. Um, this is where I start to get a little bit out of my depth, but bear with me. Um, there's work of Shalom Schwartz, who um, some of you may be familiar with, who's a, um, a social psychologist from Israel. He conducted a number of surveys across countries, so I think he's done research in over f nearly 50 countries, um, across linguistic, social, cultural uh, boundaries. And he's found consistently that there are these 57 values that people hold across th those cultures. I think the only cultures in which it hasn't been tested are indigenous cultures. Um, and as I said, yeah, I'm kind of oversimplifying here, but the body of literature is now really established on this as well. Schwartz went on to then map these relationships, these value relationships that people hold, depending on how they relate to each other. Uh, and it's also important to emphasize here that these are values that are pretty much universal. We all, sh we all hold them. It's just the strength to which we hold them um, and how we prioritize them in relation to the others that might differ from one person to another and at different times. So, for example, when I'm uh, with, my, with my kids, I'm probably, uh, I've got the, the, the laser isn't working, I don't believe, but there's um, enjoying life and uh, there's something in, on there about uh, um, exciting life and pleasure. Uh, and, and then there's things like you know, when I'm um, searching for, for bargains on the internet, I might be looking more at the, sort of the wealth and the, um, the prosperity kind of values. Uh, but the, essentially what this tells us is the closer that any one value point is to another, the more likely it is that those uh, both values will be of similar importance to the same person. And by contrast, the further one value point is from another, the less likely it is that both will be seen to be at the same sort of level of importance. It doesn't mean that people don't have a value of, of concern for the environment because they value success, for example, um, only that they'll tend to prioritise one over the other. Uh, based on these and the relationship between them, Schwartz then classified these into groups here, which suggests that there's a relationship between these values, how they relate to each other, um, and how they can be grouped together where they're largely compatible and where in opposite powers, um, sorry, opposite uh, values tend to conflict. And where it's of interest to us is in the universalism values up in the top there, where there is, um, uh, I'm looking for it because I can't spot it, protection for the environment, um, and I think there's something also about valuing uh, a world of natural beauty. But you can also see there's a cluster of other issues with those, those organisations I mentioned earlier, social justice, um, other things like that, so benevolence and equality, those sorts of values are represented up in that universalism uh, box. Um, those values are essentially more compatible with each other, but also with the values either side, the self-direction values and the benevolent values. Um, but also they act against and are opposite to the, the power values and the achievement values down here, um, which uh, such as things about uh, social, social recognition and uh, wealth and preserving public image. The oppositional relationship is important for WWF because um, all of the organisations that are working on issues of universalism, uh, which are often referred to as intrinsic values, uh, and how they relate to the extrinsic, the extrinsic values associated with power and achievement values here, um, the intrinsic values are inherently more rewarding to pursue. Their values associated with greater concern about social and environmental problems and also a greater motivation to act and, su and uh, sustainably act and continue to act in ways that help to address the problems. People who attach particular importance to intrinsic values are found on average to have lower environmental footprints and to be more motivated to engage in political activity. So anything that tends to strengthen these sorts of intrinsic universalism values is likely to build more public pressure for proportional political interventions to meet the social and environmental challenges we face. So essentially, we want more people to hold these sorts of values. And the extrinsic values down the bottom, the achievement and power values, 
uh, of wealth, public image, social power, for example, are held in opposition to the intrinsic values, and we need to, uh, fewer people to strongly hold these values if we want to affect change. And again, just to emphasize, we all hold these values, so no matter how often and how strongly they're engaged. Um, and it matters because values are strengthened the more often they're engaged, and continued strong activation of values, of the intrinsic values, uh, reduces the strength of the extrinsic values, something that's known as the seesaw effect, as one increases, the other one tends to decrease, but it can happen both ways. Um, and maybe I can kind of explain this by reference to my car. And I should say this is not my car. My car's about six years old, it's done about 60, 70,000 miles, makes funny noises here and there, and bits have started falling off it, off, off it in the last few days. Um, this, on the other hand, is the Tesla Model X crossover. And uh, bearing in mind, I'm an, I'm an environmentalist. When I see this, I hear that it's a fully electric car, and it can do 0 to 50, or 0 to 60 in five seconds, or something like that. And it has falcon doors. <laughs> I start to wonder about how I'm going to scrape together the 50 grand uh, before it launches in the UK in about two years' time. But this is an interesting illustration of how values work. Tesla have succeeded in engaging me in a desire to buy their product, uh, in part by appealing to my intrinsic values of, of concern for the environment. But essentially, through their style of their communications, the images that they use, and the sell of the car's performance, and it being essentially seen as a status symbol, uh, they're actually engaging the power values such as social recognition, wealth, and preserving my public image. And they're exactly the sorts of values that are in total opposition to the intrinsic values I would have to hold consistently and strongly for me to behave in line with universalism values such as con uh, being concerned for the environment and acting in ways that, that represent that concern. And of course, that's just one concern. But the important thing about the values, as I, say, um, as I said, is that they're like muscles. They're strengthened the more they're, they're activated. Uh, they're engaged pretty much by everything we do, whether it's the clothes that we wear in the morning or what we're going to do at the weekend or where we're going to go on holiday, who we're going to vote for at the next election. So to conclude again, every, anyone who's concerned about environmental or even social challenges, and I know there's somebody from, from Oxford in the room as well, should take a strong interest in, in how we uh, engage values and strengthen intrinsic values within society. It isn't to say that we shouldn't engage people, encourage people to take small-scale, private-sphere behavior changes. Those things are important, and it is important to do footprint analysis and tell people about the changes they can make in their own lives that will make a difference. But we really shouldn't ignore this, what, what we're kind of calling mind print sort of thing as well, about the values that really generally underpin things. And the good news, if we want to look at it this way, is that in the UK, this is an analysis from 2008, we're more predisposed towards these intrinsic universalism values than we are towards the power and extrinsic achievement values. So you might find that surprising as well when you're considering Jeff's film as well, where we saw uh, strong power values of social recognition, public image, and wealth being sort of promoted in advertising that we see around us every day, uh, that this is actually the case in the UK. So to conclude, and uh, you'll excuse me for using a fairly out-of-date and maybe slightly passe uh, change image here from the Obama campaign, but if we do really want to affect behaviour change and behaviour change that we can believe in, I think we do really need to look towards the, the value system that underpinned uh, all of our behaviours. Uh, and then it's, so it's very gradual change that we can believe in, hopefully not kind of um, evolutionary magnitudes of time that it will take, but essentially, if we do want to change behaviours, we're better off starting to think about the values frame now. Thank you.